Today on Government Matters, the National Institutes of Health is looking to the future of medicine with the launch of its new artificial intelligence project. And small businesses funded by the Defense Department are being targeted by state-sponsored Chinese firms. We'll discuss promoting American creativity while protecting intellectual property. Then, heavy monsoon flooding in Pakistan has killed more than 1,500 people. Now, survivors face devastating food shortages, and USAID is pledging millions in support. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the show that delivers insights on federal government programs, people, and operations. I'm Mimi Gerges. The National Institutes of Health just launched its $130 million Bridge to Artificial Intelligence program. Grace Peng is one of the coordinators. Grace, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mimi. So what's the overall goal of this program? The overall goal is to prepare biomedical research data for next generation artificial intelligence and machine learning models to use to, to change and improve the way we do medicine. So how is artificial intelligence currently being used? Well, artificial intelligence is growing in its current usage. Um, as you may know, it's, it's used a lot in image processing and looking at images of different parts of our body, uh, detecting cancer, uh, detecting um, um, diseases in our eye. Um, it's used in looking at our heart signals and detecting whether or not we're going to have a heart attack. Um, but it's very focused on single signals like that. Um, just very narrowly focused, looking at a lot of data, and, and the machines try to understand what that really means. So it, it has a lot of promise, but it's very limited at this point. What prompted the creation of this program now? So this program was spawned by the advice of our community, our research community, and they basically told us in their advisory report that we cannot move any further with the current data that we're using um, because the current data is incomplete. It doesn't have the information that a machine needs to know in order to fully understand the context of the data, the ethics behind the data, the biases that might be attributed to data and it doesn't really take advantage of the power of artificial intelligence that could be used to really help predict our diseases in a personalized way. Well, so let's talk about that power. What's the vision? How could AI be used to ultimately benefit the health of Americans? So AI could be used to really stitch together all kinds of modalities of data. So for example, when I talked about the images uh, that are currently being uh, taken through x-rays or, or um, ocular images or heart rate monitors. Um, it'd be, the vision is to perhaps stitch together different data types so that the machines can interpret what they mean for a specific person. So imagine when you go to a doctor, the doctor always asks for your health history and asks you what happened when you started feeling this way. And and those are the things that machines can't do. They don't have the humans inside of them to infer things. And so they need to know the history of the data. They need to know what was the context of the data in which it was collected? What was the gender of the human operator? Um, how was the patient situated? What was the temperature in the room? And those things could matter in terms of how a machine would interpret the data to predict whether or not uh, we might have cancer or heart disease or have um, multi multiple symptoms and multiple diseases that interact with each other. So what's the biggest limitation then when it comes to using AI for medical research? The biggest limitation is to address the, eth the ethics associated with using artificial intelligence. This um, is the, the promoting of, of human biases in, in the machine. Yes, and so the biggest challenge is to incorporate into the machine knowledge of, for example, um, the biases, as you mentioned, that might occur, artifacts that might occur uh, in the data, um, and then addressing privacy issues and consent issues um, and, and, and actually collecting the data so that the, the people that we're collecting the data from um, understand that their data is kept private, but yet we know the attributes of the data 
to help us uh, program these next generation models. And following on to that, you know, AI systems are only as good as the data that's feeding into them. Exactly. So how do you make sure you have good data? That is exactly the point of this program. So this program is to really start with um, thinking about a big problem, a grand challenge, a grand biomedical behavioral challenge, and having us bring together diverse experts from not only the biomedical and behavioral science fields, the engineering fields, the data science fields, but also ethicists, legal experts, anthropologists, to look at the legal issues behind the privacy and consent issues, incorporate those ethics, and standardize it into the tools and how we actually measure um, readings from the human body in order to prepare the data so that future AI ML models will be used. So this is a, a pretty new program. Yes. Where are things right now? Have you awarded contracts? We just announced the awards last week, in fact. We announced the uh, awards of seven awards. Three of the awards will be making uh, the Bridge Center, which will harmonize the data generation projects, which are motivated by these grand challenges. And so we're very excited to begin this consortium effort. We really want community input to assess us the whole way to make sure that the data will be usable and ethical and diverse. Um, and so that we can use future artificial intelligence. Well, speaking of assessment, how do you define success for this program? Success will be data that has the associated attributes that the machine can understand. So if you will, our deliverable will be to produce um, what we call data sheets and model cards, or maybe nutrition labels for the data, so we know what is behind the data. Uh, and success will be the modelers telling us that we can actually mine the data and make accurate predictions for a future precision medicine. All right, well, Grace, good luck with this program. Thanks so much for being on. Thank you. Coming up next, a program aimed at sparking American innovation is at risk. Stay with us. The Small Business Innovation Research Program, SBIR, was created by Congress in 1982 to address pressing government and societal needs in defense, health, energy, and more. But the future of the program is uncertain. Charles Wessner is adjunct professor at Georgetown University, where he teaches global innovation policy. He's also senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Charles, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. How is SBIR different from the many other government programs set up to help small businesses? Well, SBIR uh, is unique by the quality of its track record. Uh, by the number of careful evaluations by the National Academy of Sciences, uh, which are independent uh, arm's length evaluations, uh, and because it focuses on uh, perhaps one of the most critical areas in developing new products uh, to either protect the country or heal our sick, uh, and that is what's called the valley of death. Often you have a, an invention either in the university or in a small company, and you want to try and attract capital to develop that. But until you can have a prototype or prove that something uh, is likely to work, uh, private capital won't back the idea, however promising it may be. Uh, the focus of the SBR awards is to provide initial funding to help build that prototype uh, and prove to first the government in a phase two, and secondly to the private capital markets that this is something that's worthwhile. Well, you said that it has a track record, so let's talk about that. What direct benefit has this funding had to the American taxpayer? Well, the benefits have been, have been manifest. I mean, there have been benefits to American soldiers in the Iraqi war. Uh, another advantage of the program is that they're, it's fast, it gets things done for the Defense Department much faster than the normal, long-lasting, highly complicated procurement process. Um, you may know people who've had lazy guy surgery. Uh, that came out of a NASA program for parking space vehicles. Um, perhaps the most stunning one is uh, early support for Qualcomm that had this unlikely idea that you'd be able to compress uh, radio signals for uh, telecommunications 
it's the basis of what we're talking on now. It's the basis for all, all our cell phones. It has completely transformed the way we live and work, for better or for worse. But it is just, you know, just a foundational investment that has, has transformed our, our So then, world. Charles, what's the problem here? You know, how are, are the Chinese appropriating technologies that are developed through the SBIR? Well, they're appropriating is a kind word. Um, Stealing. You know, Yes, they, well, they copy they, and they steal a lot. Um, and I think the key thing to remember there is there's nothing new about this. They've been tracking the program since 1989. The, the, uh, they try and copy what we do, um, and sometimes they actually steal the technologies. The solution to that is to try and protect our small companies. So when they get an award, they should also get technical support uh, for cybersecurity. But so so is, let's let's actually talk about that, though, um, Charles. How do you protect American R&D investment from the Chinese government? Well, you do that by setting up the protocols that are necessary, providing the training uh, for the particularly for the small companies. Uh, and you can do that through existing programs like the Manufacturing Extension Program. Uh, there are ways to do it. The problem is we've not much focused on it. But, th but there's a really strange element to this. The idea that we would stop a proven, highly effective program because the Chinese are trying to steal the result or copy it, well, are we going to stop funding MIT because they try and steal the results or copy, or Harvard, as is there in recent cases? Of course not. But, but they're not just trying to steal it, they are stealing it. And, yes, and that's taxpayer money that's going to help the Chinese. Uh, no, it's helping us first. Uh, and my point again is, if they copy something from Lockheed Martin or, or steal it from them, should we stop supporting Lockheed Martin? Of course not. Should we stop supporting our universities because there's an active cyber attack problem? No. We have to defend against it. And there will be some losses. They're very good. Uh, but, <laughs> I mean, the irony is, if they copy it uh, and want to develop it, and we're going to stop the program that has created these types of technologies, they'll have them and we won't. So, stop Charles, if, if this uh, program were to be ended or, or cut, um, can you spell out the risks to the, the warfighter uh, oh, in the yeah. end? Well, the Undersecretary for Defense Acquisition uh, recently wrote, uh, uh, pointing out that, th that they would lose over 1,600 active awards trying to solve problems. Uh, it it would be it would be a colossal mistake to stop the program. And you know, when our most senior defense officials are saying, "For heaven's sakes, we need this," when we're confronted with a wide variety of threats around the world, uh, stopping a program that works because someone is trying to siphon away some of the advantages simply makes no sense. All right, Charles, appreciate you being on the program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Coming next, USAID is helping millions of people around the world. From securing grain from Ukraine to providing aid to Pakistan, we talked to the assistant to the administrator about those efforts. Stay with us. I've seen many humanitarian disasters in the world, but I have never seen climate carnage on this scale. Historic monsoon rain has left nearly a third of Pakistan underwater. The flooding has damaged nearly all of the country's crops, leaving the country facing a food shortage. I recently spoke to Sarah Charles. She's the assistant to the administrator of USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance about their efforts to help. You recently visited Pakistan with Administrator uh, Samantha Power. Can you describe the reality of what people are, are facing there? Yes, I just got back last week. I traveled with Administrator Power to, to Pakistan, to Karachi, a uh, flyover of Sindh, one of the most affected provinces in Pakistan, um, as well as uh, meetings with government officials in Islamabad. I think you're, what your guests are seeing right now is water as far as the eye can see, really historic levels of flooding in Pakistan. We often think about this in contrast to, um, to flooding in Pakistan in 2010, where we saw rapid onset, um, very severe flooding, 
um, what, what they call in Pakistan riverine flooding, but in some ways this is even more severe because the water is, is affecting areas that aren't used to that kind of flooding, um, standing water that could be there really for, for not just weeks, but months, um, impacting really the, the, one of the most productive agricultural areas of Pakistan. So we have both the immediate impacts of the flooding, people displaced, um, even still living in some cases in standing water, but also what we see are, are likely long-term impacts as the, the country's cotton crop, the country's wheat crop has been devastated by this flooding. So the U.S. has pledged an additional $30 million in aid. Break that down for us. What will those funds be used for? So Mimi, we, we actually have now pledged $50 million in assistance. So $30 million a couple of weeks ago. And then when I was in Pakistan last week, we announced an additional 20 million, bringing our total support to over 50 million for um, the victims of flooding in Pakistan. This will provide and is already starting to provide um, the kinds of um, shelter material and tarps that you see being unloaded by U.S. military planes right there, um, uh, emergency supplies that were flying in from Dubai, um, but also cash, food, uh, and food assistance to help people that are displaced right now with their immediate needs. And also, as we look towards the coming, um, coming days and weeks, we're increasingly concerned in Pakistan about um, disease, about disease impacting people, Kale, uh, cholera, dengue, malaria, and so our interventions are also focused on critical water and sanitation support as well as health support to help prevent disease in these areas that are that are coping with standing water. And about how many people will that actually help? So we, we're still very much in, in the phase of trying to get assistance to those that, that need it need it most. There are um, upwards of 33 million people that are displaced. This assistance will reach um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, but certainly not um, not the 33 million that are that are desperately in need of assistance. And we've been pleased to see, um, even from the government of Pakistan, uh, cash assistance, um, well over $100 million going out through their social protection system. But we're also calling on other donors to come in and support, uh, support the humanitarian response and early recovery and, and longer-term rec reconstruction needs in Pakistan. Uh, switching now to the effects of the war in Ukraine, uh, Sarah, it's, it's made the global food shortage much worse. Um, but when we talk about a shortage, what does that actually mean in terms of the number of people impacted by it? So we, we could really see this year, um, we were already facing a global food security crisis driven by supply chain disruptions as a result of COVID, the lingering effects of COVID, um, spikes in prices, because again, those, those lingering effects of COVID and the kind of climate shocks that we're seeing um, in Pakistan right now, um, as well as drought in places like the Horn. But the war in Ukraine has been an absolute accelerant on, on that, um, that very dire, already very dire food security situation. Ukraine um, has historically been the breadbasket, not just of Europe, but has fed the world and in particular fed the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, places that were already food insecure, a critical supplier of wheat and other corn, uh, vegetable oil to places like the Horn of Africa, West Africa and the Middle East. And so what we've seen as Ukrainian wheat has come off the market is both shortages in critical places, um, but also spikes in prices as uh, commodity traders and others anticipate longer term shortages. We've been uh, very involved and are supportive of efforts to get Ukrainian wheat out of Ukraine, uh, a Black Sea port deal um, that is facilitating commercial traffic as well as humanitarian traffic out of Black Sea ports to get what grain has been harvested out of Ukraine. We've also been supporting inside of Ukraine efforts to, uh, to uh, produce agriculture in the future. Um, but it's clearly, it's clearly not yet enough. And Sarah, you just mentioned uh, the uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and how that's being impacted by the global food crisis. You were there in July. What did you see? I traveled to both Somalia and northern Kenya. Northern Kenya is an area that I actually began my career in, and I could I could 
rattle off numbers where we're seeing 20 million people at risk of starvation. That number could spike to 26 million in the next couple of months as we face not just a record fourth failed rainy season in the Horn of Africa, but now uh, increasing likelihood of a fifth failed rainy season that's driving um, displacement and deprivation across Kenya, Ethiopia, and Somalia. In Kenya, we met with um, pastoralist uh, individuals that had previously had hundreds of goats and cows that sustained them, their families, their communities, now have herds of two, three, four animals, in some cases, no animals. And the knock-on effects of this are extreme. So. Um, individuals, again, that are faced with um, no source of livelihood, no source of sustenance, the, the animals being critical to um, not just uh, meat production, uh, not just income, but also critical milk for, for children. We visited and saw severely malnourished children because their parents have no, uh, no means of livelihoods. And at the same time, the price of of wheat, as we just discussed, the price of corn, the price of critical staples in Kenya has gone through the roof. Um, and we see the same in Somalia and Ethiopia as well. All right, Sarah, well, we appreciate your work around the world and uh, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you. If you miss an episode of Government Matters, it's on our website, govmatters.tv. And tell us what you thought about today's program. You can reach us on Twitter at govmatters.tv. Follow us to get the latest updates, reminders, and links to our latest interviews. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 10.30 on WJLA 24-7 News and Sunday mornings at 10.30 on 7 News to stay plugged in on issues that matter to the federal government. Thanks for watching. I'm Mimi Gerges.